Hello everyone, today we talk about the central northern Italian regional states and this picture that stretches from the balance to the crisis of the Italian liberty. Today actually we don't reach the, the latter extreme. We never did really. Uh, we made multiple videos about uh, the, uh, the, the, in fact, the Treaty of Lodi mostly and the policy of equilibrium as it was uh, intended at the time it was actually something a bit more than just a freezing of the uh, political I say the, the territorial boundaries of the various uh, Italian regional states and it was especially a product in fact of a mm, of a crisis that uh, at the end of the Middle Ages and the thresholds of the modern age the Italian states were undergoing from a political point of view, uh, recognizing, as we will see now, especially as far as the Aragonese conquest of southern Italy is concerned, the and the fall of Constantinople, by the way, in 1453, was effectively the, the one that really made the Pope triggering the the Treaty of Lodi and the Italic League. Uh, 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 it's a compaction, in fact, of Italian city-states in in the face of um, a foreign pressure that was increasing and that at the time was not quite even pictured properly. As you know the Italian city-states uh, during the 14th and 15th century had undergone uh, in fact an important mm, uh, dynamic of political territorial recompaction. Essentially you pass from literally 30 uh, de facto independent city-states to something more compact around. In fact the main powers, we'll see now, that were Milan, Venice, uh, Florence, and the Papal States there were other smaller ones interspersed uh, among them. Some of the major ones were I don't know um, Genoa or um, or Ferrara, and others even smaller ones like Mantua, that however had a remarkable strategic significance in the balance. In that case, especially at the frontier between uh, Milan and and Venice, um, this process had uh, been rendered possible by uh, the in fact the oligarchization of power as mm, all over in Europe from from the 14th century the um, and the development uh, the experimentation especially in Italy of very updated style uh, forms and models that in fact would be uh, were already at this point at the base in fact not just of humanistic and renaissance principles but also of much of modern European political theory and practice, right? We made some video about the Italian lordships per se and something also military uh, that we will keep probably at this point I'm making just manualistic stuff as you see but I want to come back on track with the military stuff and we have observed the, the, the the peculiar nature of the Italian peninsula because uh, in many ways of course every country is different but Italy uh, was an, uh, an exception and a paradox in many ways. It was in relative terms the richest and more developed country in Europe if not actually in the world. Um, it had surely in the rank kind of fallen uh, in fact under other countries however that had expanded more in, in later centuries and especially in a unitary sense the first example is France, right? That already had a you know old, very old unitary uh, tradition, um, but it maintained, in fact, also an absolute power of of enormous scale. I mean, just the the naval potential of Venice and Genoa, if combined, would have kept out a any foreign power out of the peninsula. It of course also develops, in fact, um, across the sea, and you know requires that uh, that naval uh, capacity, uh, the, the 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 system was heavily, in fact, active also from a military point of view. It was also heavily fortified. It had some of the most advanced, uh, properly military and technological um, achievements of the time. The Venetian condotta was at the, the same time of the Burgundian army of Charles Bort, the, the easily the, the most advanced uh, army uh, in Europe, and uh, what say explanations regarding the, the Italian crisis before the in fact the Italian wars uh, and the discovery 
also abroad that the system was permeable, with, which was not really thought more than much before Charles VIII expedition he proved that instead. Uh, was caused not much by uh, some technical deficit. Some have looked at the military system and saying, right, this really was really backwards, or at least it was could not compete with a broad organization. But the real point being, actually, in fact, was always political. And standing in the fragmentation of these powers that were individually so, in fact, um, so independent and so powerful, uh, concretely, that they didn't quite need to share uh, power with anybody. We've seen this was a prerogative, essentially, of the of the Italian city states that they had emerged as real countries individually, right? Uh, leagues in the rest of Europe, Pictians, etc., were essentially powerful in as much as they were all these towns uh, clustered together and kind of um, interplaying there with, with other uh, powers and trying to you know negotiate from that mass standpoint. A single Italian city state, I mean, pick, pick Venice or Milan, right? They had a Individually, military potentials were as large as one of, you know, the main powers in Europe um, of a kingdom, and it suffices to, to just see what, in fact, the, their numbers, their, their military organization. Um, but the country was split, right? So we, now we are descending too much, maybe towards actually the latter extreme, because that is what explains it's the proof of the thing, and um, maybe at the end of the video we will come back partially on that, because the system that was established in the mid-15th century in many ways was not really even unhinged by the Italian wars. This is quite interesting. I mean, those main Italian powers would remain fundamentally the same, right? The uh, the Spanish would seize Milan at the end of the war. The, the Dutch was actually the most statal-like country in, uh, say, polity in, in Italy. But you pick Venice, you pick even Genoa, you pick Tuscany, the papal states, oh, were Savoy, those would remain essentially autonomous, right? They weren't commanded really by anybody. Um, Southern Italy was different because it was first, first uh, an Angevin and then an Aragonese possession. It was complicated to rule from the external. These were vice kingdoms, depending at that point, as we'll see now from Aragon. Uh, I mean, both uh, Southern Italy and Sicily. There was obviously a, a local... Uh, aristocracy essentially ruling together with the, uh, with, with the monarch and there were very intense contrasts from that point of view including some uh, states within the state and uh, think about the principality of Tarrant or the Duchy of Calabria that up to in fact almost the second modern age they, they remained kind of uh, autonomous from Naples in that instance and even with some remarkable power so it's always a complex picture that kept it would, would keep being mm, played uh, over the centuries later on, right? Also at the swings that were going on in, in the rest of Europe, internationally speaking. But importantly enough, however, the loss of Italian liberty would further cement that uh, impossibility of the development of a unitary, uh, in fact, probably a unification of the country under the any hegemonic power that could achieve that, factually mostly Milan had been had gone pretty close to that, especially as far as, as it concerns central and northern Italy. The problem was always the papacy in between and that, that obstacle was be never surpassed up to the uh, the nineteenth century. Um, but it's also true in fact that central and northern Italy were substantially different from the south that was essentially a feudal reality it had had historically yes some kind of communal phenomenon you know even the first maritime republics had been born there but starting from norman times and then under the uh, the, the swabians the angevins and the aragonese would take uh, a direction that is evident especially since uh, in fact even there the, the mid 14th century crisis literally two worlds and two cultures and two areas that were substantially um, becoming a part um, in a way and here it's the moment in which the, the Aragonese power breaks in probably the Italian mainland because Sicily as you know had been seized by Aragon after the Vespers in the 13th century 
and the Angevins in Naples had tried, uh, to, that were initially, by the way, the, the largest power of the two, to recover Sicily fruitlessly with an enormous effort. But the Angevin kingdom by the mid-15th by the, the mid century was um, falling apart for dynastic reasons, but just because of the broader collapse of the structure internally that in fact hadn't displayed the same vivacity of, of the sceneries of the city-states of the north. And this allowed the Aragonese to enter, to, to seize literally the, uh, the southern Italian mainland and to establish and to literally reunify what was initially the Kingdom of Sicily. You know that even Naples was known as Kingdom of Sicily uh, at that point, right? Uh, because both sides hadn't wanted to renounce to the unitary Sicilian legacy of the, of, of the older kingdom. And the Aragonese uh, break-in was possible also and especially in relation to Milan. As we were saying before, if some kind of Italian power hadn't agreed with backing some foreign interference, really, that had been a unitary Italian bloc, uh, the country would have been off limits. The Milanese, however, were being threatened significantly under the Duke um, Philipp, mm, Filippo Maria Visconti uh, by their, their neighbors, uh, chiefly Venice, that historically had been, as a maritime republic, mostly concerned about coastal possessions, but seeing the, the expansion of Milan in the Po Valley and also the, the, those mainland interests, for example, the salt mines uh, near to the lagoons, etc., threatened uh, since the, the 14th century, even before, um, at least as a form of monopolium at, at, at distance, let's say, uh, had thought well to, to to make this radical turn and creating a, actually a massive state in northeastern Italy that reached up to, almost to Milan, right? These are the time in which the cities of Brescia and Bergamo are very close to the Visconti capital are definitely control, um, uh, say, ensured in, in their control by, by Venice. That was also governing this important land mass in, in a very coherent and mm, functional way, right, and failing the main condottieri, so to kind of tie them to the destinies of, of the Republic, um, entering the broader uh, Central European play, because fundamentally uh, Venice, as you know, was not part of the Holy Roman Empire historically as an entity. So the fact that they were also conquering instead some northern Italian lands that historically belonged to the Kingdom of Italy and therefore to, to the Holy Roman Emperor was uh, quite of a, you know, um, a political siding in the international uh, arena. And very often the Emperor at this point could not even intervene fruitfully. Um, the Milanese has scored an important victory over the Swiss at Arbedo in 1422, which is incidentally what also triggered uh, the uh, eventually the, the Swiss military reform that we know of Renaissance times, because the, literally the dismounted uh, men-at-arms of Carmagnola had repelled the, the Swiss, still mostly equipped with halberds, just with their own lances and inflicted heavy losses, and so the Swiss thought well now in their countenance away from indiscreet eyes in their valleys um, to reform their military in the ferocious way that we know would have changed effectively. Um, uh, Western warfare from, let's say, medieval to, to towards at least modern direction, but aside from this success, Milan had suffered important defeats, um, had tried to maintain some good contacts with Savoy, sometimes giving them some towns in the Po Valley to acquiesce with them or marrying uh, in, into their dynasty but without, I don't know, requiring dowry, all these kind of things because there was a lot of pressure from other minor uh, states and especially also from the from the Venetian Florentine alliance that had always been historically since the 14th century anti-Milanese because Milan had really had the lion's share on the Italian military power, had was a hell of a state and uh, very powerful and invaded Tuscany many times, had seized even some uh, areas of the Papal States. And so 
it was evidently, and it, it did, really did have the, the capabilities of hegemonizing central and northern Italy under an Italian crown. And, uh, and they didn't succeed really randomly at some point, just because of some battles that could have really shifted the size of the, the strategic um, balance for, for Milan to conquer uh, the, entire, the entire region. And Aragon, in this scene, had mostly competed, as you know, with, with Genoa in the, in the Western Mediterranean. It had the, the Aragonese-Venetian alliance in the 14th century had obliged the Genoese to change a bit their, uh, their area. Uh, of trade, they they opened the Atlantic route, uh, from which also Spain and England benefited. And in a way, it was, this is the age of explorations. The Genoese essentially meant all the the crews, the the ships, the or they provided the, the the admirals for for all those countries of France, etc. We were renowned, but they, as Venice initially, they they didn't have much of a mainland, so their power was entirely maritime. And Aragon was instead like a, a bulky power. It was a crown. I made a video about that in autumn because we have to distinguish the kingdom of Aragon from the crown of Aragon that um, actually encompassed multiple multiple powers such as the county of Catalonia, the, the Balearic kingdom, uh, Sardinia, Sicily, and Naples eventually, and more, some possessions in Greece, others uh, also along the Mediterranean coast. Uh, of Iberia in the south, so um, it was a very peculiar power on its own because it brought uh, a very different political culture from, especially the one of Castile, that was kind of a much more like a centralistic feudal steamroller, right? Whereas uh, the Aragonese, read the Catalans, mostly the center of power, Barcelona, were kind of more uh, jealous of the. The political liberties of the autonomies of the various kingdoms and so on. In fact, even when the when the Aragonese uh, seized those Mediterranean islands, they they would factually rule them mostly from say would lose coordination. They they, they would also be at war sometimes with each other. Right? Um, Sicily wouldn't do exactly what Aragon was doing at some point. Um, the same not the the Sardinian possessions. Um, towards the end of the Middle Ages, however, also the crown of Aragon had. Be began to re say reshape or consolidate its power at least to ensure some some platform on the base of which the um Catalan Commonwealth could call it heretically like this could expand. And uh had looked mostly in fact at uh, southern Italy, uh, that is the Neapolitan kingdom of the Angevins to to take. As the tides had turned, they were factually now the more powerful ones. It was the first expedition in the 30s that failed uh, at the siege of Gaeta, where the Visconti were actually supporting the Neapolitans through the uh, the, the Genoese uh, fleet that was sending reinforcements. Uh, to them. Um, this because Genoa had fallen fundamentally under the Milanese orbit, historically. They had tried to escape, maintain some contacts with France as well, with the Dauphiné especially. And um, so uh, allegiances that could switch in that, uh, in that realm, but fundamentally the Milanese power was the most, uh, the closest at this point. Uh, the Genoese were also quite scared of the Aragonese expansionism, so at sea, and they were acting like that. And on, on the siege of Gaeta, uh, the uh, the Angevins managed to capture, actually the Saint Genoese, I think, uh, the King Alfonso the Fifth of Aragon, and his two brothers, if I'm not wrong, and who were deported to Milan. And in this prisoning. Alfonso, there was, as you know, a very famous figure, you know, in Iberian history, he was a, a mess and ass and kind of a, um, you know, a culture, the typically Renaissance monarch and powerful, so men, men of war, etc., managed to convince Filippo Maria Visconti, Duke of Milan, that, after all, uh, the Aragonese conquest of Naples would have been 
uh, a Milanese interest, right? Because they could fundamentally agree around a project of political framing of the Italian peninsula in two macro areas, that is a central northern one dominated by the Visconti and a southern and insular one by the Aragonese king. And it kind of made sense because again, the, the watershed was the papacy, right? That's still trying to, to, to survive in its own uh, way and keeping these areas also conveniently split. And the, the Pope was not happy at all of the Aragonese invasion, at least initially because it, um, you know, they hadn't consented to it. Uh, Southern Italy was a papal thief historically, so it could not really change uh, uh, ruler without papal permission uh, and such and was always the risk of this uh, kingdom to eventually as a Roman neighbor to uh, to overcome to overwhelm the central Italian possession it was always a risk there would be always wars etc the papacy could count actually in a very warlike uh, central Italian and Roman aristocracy that provided in fact um, the best generals at the time and if the papal states had not been kind of so feudally patched together really uh, probably it, it is central Italy would have been the military potential to unify uh, to unify Italy uh, and this is often overlooked later on you have the the Duke of Valentinois the, uh, you know the infamous son of of Pope Alexander Borgia would kind of attempt some kind of thing like that but it was it was just you know difficultly feasible by it, especially in that situation in any case um, there was always as you understand a competition between the states independently from this uh, and and from some pre-orderly alignments because also because there were many right and also the other European countries were ever more interested in Italy and this was very very much looked at everybody was looking at what was, was happening there because it was becoming literally the tip of the balance of the entire European policy anyways for Germany for England for France uh, France had had historical ties with the Visconti uh, that would be also the the excuse for which not just Charles VIII invaded Naples but also claimed you know the French claimed properly the suzerainty on on Milan after the this force succeeded the Visconti also you know this forces were removed from the throne um, the Visconti had married in French royalty uh, famously enough and they had initially been kind of pro-French right now so this was an important shift because they shifted towards Spain Spain later on would have also been uh, if not properly unified but let's say would have summed uh, as a single um, as a single power, as you know, both Castilla and Aragon with the Res Catholicos and became factually the most powerful mm, country, at least after France, right? And that's who actually struggled in Italy, again, aside from some also German involvement in the Italian wars, as you know. And this change was advantageous because f objectively the, uh, the Milanese had always as we've seen aimed at securing a northern central Italian power they were more uh, they were a continental power Milan didn't have a real fleet again it, they uh, they used the Genoese they, they were mostly a was a land power and say enclosed by the the Alpine uh, chains that was very watchful was happening uh, beyond them, especially with France that was essentially winning the Hundred Years' War and it would have been just a matter of time before not just it would have re, uh, recompacted its um, territorial unity but also invaded the same Italy. And as we've seen, the Milanese had struggled also with the contention of the Alpine passes to the Swiss that were their old um, opponents. They also had some connection with, with the Empire not just because they were vassals, etc., but because at a time they, they had had to fence off even some kind of Germanic um, intervention. So at, at that point, the main problem was Venice, right? That, as we've seen, had dramatically 
grain degraded its uh, terrestrial capacities was literally threatening the Visconti capital a few from a few tens of kilometers so much that even the later um, dynastic change you know between the, the Visconti uh, at the death of Filippo Maria with the, and the rise of the of Francesco Sforza who had married Filippo's uh, uh, illegitimate daughter Bianca uh, had been rendered possible with the Venetian uh, support because uh, essentially the death of the tyrant let's say the some some Milanese oligarchs had launched this kind of anachronistic Republican experiment uh, the Ambrose the golden Ambrosian Republic or something basically the Venetians backed Francesco Sforza it also had the support of Cosimo de Medici as we will see now to take over which he did took over Milan and established the Sforza dynasty there but also started to rule again as a Milanese so a bit with the same problems that were um, occurring at, at that point and Florence was fundamental in that switch because the, um, the Florentines at this point were coming to grips with the Venetians for commercial reasons uh, the Venetians were ever more interested let's say in the in mainland Italy as we've seen and so the Florentines were really watchful of this in part because the Ottomans were advancing in the Mediterranean and so Venice was just forced a bit to re mm, let's say continentalize re Italianize a bit and um, the same Aragonese conquest of southern Italy was posing a severe threat to Florence it was essentially the weaker of all the major uh, Italian powers from a military point of view and so Florence kind of accepted after centuries of hostility against Milan that had objectively threatened to 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 uh, to, to take over Florence it was a you know not just the tyranny versus Republican model but also the the Ghibelline versus Guelph model etc this was bypassed quite quite uh, concretely pragmatically because Florence realized that they needed a strong protector in the land that, that would have not been the Venetians um, so actually a lip backwards as we were saying Alfonso V was liberated by Filippo Maria after having agreed on this and so the, the Genoese were quite triggered by this they even rose in revolt because they said what the hell you you basically uh, you basically let our major maritime rivals taking over a major landmass like the, the Kingdom of Naples it's an enormous power altogether again that we will have to pay the burden of but the Genoese alone couldn't really do much and in fact uh, it would happen exactly that uh, Milan backed Alfonso V in his second expedition to Naples in the 40s that brought to its capture and the establishment of the Aragonese dynasty uh, in southern Italy uh, this alarmed dramatically also the Venetians uh, at that point because it was a formidable northern southern Italian alliance it was also threatening from between Apulia and, and the Balkans the in fact the Otranto Strait and so the Venetian um, crossing uh, that the, the Republic depended on actually Venice had a stronger hand because in, in, in all these upheavals the Venetians also exploited the situation to take some uh, Apulian ports from the in fact from from from, south, from from the southern kingdom and it wouldn't be really dislodged as always because they could control the citadel from the sea uh, the major European land masses at the time weren't really, but, or any other land mass, usually at the time, any naval power per se. Venice instead uh, had, had the most powerful navy uh, in Europe. And this um, always brought some friction to some adjustments, some, um, some issues, and negotiations, and further diplomacy was dramatically boosted by all these conflicts at the time. So much that it's in Italy and 
in uh, in fact in a major satellite country like France so that diplomacy as we know it began to literally take shape in a permanent form uh, in what we think a modern kind of diplomacy with permanent seats uh, kind of officialized formalized uh, communications encounters uh, and so on uh, needless to say the Italian Renaissance culture was also pretty homogeneous at this point. So the Italian city states had always been, um, and they, they, they had, and exactly because of these internal conflicts that had brought them always to imitate each other by a certain degree and to homogenize dramatically the political, military, and diplomatic practice. With the Milanese uh, Aragonese agreement, you have for the umpteenth time in Italian history. Uh, the reproposal of a will to, of, let's say, re-systematization of the fragmented Italian war. It was not a unitary one, because as you understand, it was just, you know, sharing the peninsula between two plus actually other powers. And in fact, um, this thing wouldn't really succeed, as we will see. There was uh, an ascent from, from the Visconti, uh, to Alfonso V settling on a Napoleon throne um, and from there uh, to uh, say launch some initiatives in order to weaken the traditional foes of Milan that is uh, again the Genoese now the Florentines and the Venetians especially but the plan failed exactly be because of the equilibrium that effectively conferred to none of these states a decisive strategic uh, superiority over the other, right? And especially, the same fragmentation was a, a dramatically effective system to prevent, right, to, to shift properly uh, center of power, and therefore to ensure that nobody would really monopolize that. Um, this is a, a very important factor not just for Italy, but for Europe in general, if you consider it in its evident political fragmentation, it's been studied and affirmed, uh, not just to develop dramatically those capitalistic forms that we know, but properly having a much more complex view of political military practice, knowing how to negotiate, knowing how to appreciate each other, uh, views and perspectives it would be even especially with the Ottoman onslaught right in, in in Europe that showed how at the end of the day it was the various European states that had the, the upper hand over the the Ottomans at some point even single-handedly think about the Habsburgs or Venice so uh, of course it took time here the the Ottomans were swarming uh, in the Balkans and really creating lots of problems that with the fall of Constantinople became ever more evident to the Westerners. We made lots of videos about that. But at the same time, and I, I would say is specifically in the Italian situation, this idea that we see also in the modern age of Italians managing to still preserve some autonomy, they would negotiate, right? I wouldn't say even the, the mafia culture, but let's say the, the idea that it was a, a sovereign power, namely, but then eventually the thing was managed by the local aristocracies in a, in a ne negotiation between the, the and this is true especially in southern Italy in fact but it was at large evident considering the size of the Italians the single Italian states compared to I don't know major uh, unitary monarchies like France Spain etc that let's say yes they were smaller but they could always find a way out they could <laughs> always kind of um, find a solution to 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 escape the pressure, the full control, the full assimilation. This is relevant because other countries in Europe, like think about the Ottoman conquest or still the, the, the later expansion of other powers in late modern age, wouldn't, um, I'd say, would, would cripple significantly the local culture not to, to develop into into some broader powers. I mean, I think, think about after Kosovo Polia, how a Serbian power in the Balkans was factually prevented from existing because at that point hadn't the, the Ottomans been there the Serbians were the only ones who would have taken over 
uh, the Bulgarians had been destroyed by the Byzantines, and even if they had reemerged, they they you know that that strong imperial unity had been lost. Well, with Italy, this wouldn't happen. As a matter of fact, uh, more or less at the same time, also the Germans did this. The Italy was reunified, right? Still, importantly, with with foreign support, but still to recreate something that much older than it, it's usually thought actually existed in the form of a national culture, right? And this is especially evident in humanistic and Renaissance Italy. The fact that out of the Latin Middle Ages, Italian vernacular had emerged fundamentally as the same, contrary to the, to the stereotype in all the peninsula, right? The, these people wrote and, and spoke all the same language. They actually understood each other, right? It wasn't make the case because by the 19th century, of course, other countries had had a uh, uh, a, a multi-secular unitary tradition and therefore had homogenized much further their culture and so I don't know the industrialized Savoy and the stagnating Bourbon were dramatically different but let's say in between right and especially in the probably in the northern let's say pick the Po Valley in central Italy it was a dramatic homogeneity since medieval times we've seen it many times in the videos about communal Italy again the political institutional practice the administration same art the same, the same language, the same literature, which is impressive because really no country at the time had the same degree of mm, homogeneous advancement that, that, that this system had. But as we've seen, Italy is the paradox because it's exactly that kind of individual self-confidence and, confidence and kind of municipalism that had characterized the emergence of the city-states, like unlike anywhere else in Europe had been the core of a state had rendered them dramatically individualistic minded. They, they wouldn't see the broader benefit in, of making, making a, uh, a common front against uh, foreign intervention and instead was seen as, okay, I, I can't gain from that foreign intervention because that goes at the expense of my neighbor, but yes, I will kind of, maybe the system will become more unstable, but for now I will become more powerful, right? Eventually, the system kind of decayed altogether in terms of, in, of com overall freedom, right? But it's also true that at the time, we've seen it also, for example, of the, in the reaction of the Westerners to the Ottoman advance. Like, at the time, the, like the, we know how things went, right? But at the time, just like today, you, couldn't, you can't really know how it will go. Like, our uh, political strategic analysis are the at best a three four month uh, range right and also not in the event of major accidents right like as we've seen now pandemics wars etc that instead do happen because we live in a real world right so even more at the time where normally the the political landscape was 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 that fragmented by default right um, and actually it was an exception here that you had fully developed states that were still, that were already able to kind of mediate some broader solutions. And this is in fact indeed what Alfonso V had to learn quickly after having become king of Naples, right? And not just because of the, uh, of the, the turbulent uh, say a tur the tormented Italian situation, where by the way we have pictured this main powers but there were lots of smaller ones that were mostly under the influence of, of the major ones but were often also changing side were kind of buffer states uh, they could be pressured on um, but also in fact the internal interference in in the in the system right the the Neapolitan barons were quite of a problem for the Aragonese development were important economical policies that were carried out to prevent their further expansion to control the cities, the markets, the grains that southern Italy also exported importantly all over Europe, the Mediterranean. So um, as we've seen the the twenties and the thirties of the fifteenth century had seen the renewal of the clash between the Duchy of Milan and the Republic of Venice. And Florence uh, changed the game too, we have seen. Uh, Cosimo de' Medici, that was a crypto lord of Florence because it actually was just a republic, but 
the the Medici had literally bought the entire city, so they ruled it as a per, uh, as a personal possession, almost private possession. Um, had been friends with the Sforza, uh, with Francesco specifically, that had held had held the same Cosmo when he was uh, also exiled. He, he went actually went to to Venice, but there was an important connection also with the uh, some Milanese milieu. At that point, we made a video about Cosimo de Medici, how he engineered fundamentally a, a seigneurial, um, I would say, intensification on under his um, guidance without really altering too much the institutional uh, Florentine Republican order um, on the f on the facade, at least, and. Florence from this would gain, uh, which is evident also later on with uh, Lorenzo, a role of mediation between the peninsular powers, right? Because they, as we've seen, Florence militarily wise didn't really count much. At some point, it would be inv it would be invaded by by Naples. This is famous under Lorenzo that went quite courageous, by the way, alone in Naples at that point to, to mediate. And so there was this charisma and prestige that the Florentine rulers had gained at that point, because they still counted importantly in Tuscany, as they also uh, basically were at the head, not much of a state, but a sort of confederacy, right? That's how the Florentines had built their own state, right? The, the Milanese had kind of brought everything under the... Uh, almost a monarchy there and homogenized all the administrative practice etc in Lombardy uh, Tuscany was traditionally like the land of, of liberties of the individual cities that were factually under Florence but still you know kind of more uh, in a softer way just it was the mostly the, the financial power of the city that kept them under and they inter control the interest of the markets so also had Tuscany broken down it would have probably become like a junk like like a sort of Vietnam for anybody who would like like to, to get into it uh, and in fact that's also the reason why the Spanish later on engineered the the Grand Duchy of Tuscany under the Medici and to f just maintaining that as also as a, the unitary country that existed up to yeah in fact up to the Italian unification now um, after the death of Filippo Maria Visconti in 1447 and some years of intense wars, by the way, um, emerged finally, also because the contendants were frankly tired of all this bloodshed, a more consistent perspective of comprehensive framing of the Italian reality. Right? And this was actually um, suggested by the, by the fall of Constantinople, because the Italians, as the Central Europeans, knew that they would have been next, right? Venice had already tasted like what it meant to lose important possessions in the Aegean because of the Ottoman conquest, etc. So uh, there was a great, um, it, you know, it was a this great sensation made by the fall uh, of Constantinople, and uh, the Italians thought to. Unite in a sort in in a with a league, right? The the Italic League of 1455. That wasn't just created because of the Ottomans, but exactly in order to preserve this balance between the states and also avoiding, at that point, the acknowledged foreign pressure that was coming ever more. In fact, 1453 is not just the fall of Constantinople, but also the victory of France in the Hundred Years' War. So really, an important turning point in European history. So this brought to the famous Treaty of Lodi in 1454 between essentially Milan and Venice as the, the greatest powers um, that was gradually accepted by the uh, respective allies of the, two, of the two states, starting what was a 40 years uh, peace in practice but balance would be better because there were actual wars also fought between 1454 and 1494 uh, when, when the French invaded. Um, but there were minor ones and there were kind of proxy thing. I mean, uh, there weren't major 
was it was a major escalation between these various powers and so um everybody was extremely picky right you know that little cast as this this is what Guicciardini wrote later on trying also to to stress the uh, the relative uselessness of this of this agreement that every single castle would cause a uh, the passing into someone else's hand would create an enormous problem because you know everybody was spying on each other saying you know you're trying to do this at my expense etc was not really a piece there were even clashed um, contentions let's say but um, it, it is true that for 40 years the region was overall peaceful and this system was granted by in fact the uh, uh, a 25 years long league that was intended properly from a military point of view that was the Italic League of the following year among the major powers so this was the Republic of Venice, the Duchy of Milan the Republic of Florence the Papacy and the Kingdom of Naples and these powers were factually regional states right um, to them made reference the other major and uh, minor dominations that were as we've seen siding or interspersed uh, among them and the, the the peace of Lodi sanctioning the territorial existing territorial situation stabilized the political map of Italy that albeit with some variation roughly remained such from the mid fifteenth century to the eighteenth because the eighteenth eventually with the, the French Revolution etc the invasion etc the uh, new new blocks were created new powers some powers eventually would be cancelled others kind of broke under somebody else's control but even in there there is a continuity uh, of course and uh, you can argue that yes it the, the map did represent the, the, the you know the, the, the of these two periods still displayed some of the earlier dynamics naturally you know, very changed context also internal situation but that had been established back in the day at the end of the Middle Ages and again because these polities were really considerable right uh, as we've seen also under the Spanish like the I don't know up to the 18th century uh, the I don't know the Kingdom of Sicily was one of the, the largest powers on, on paper uh, in, in in Europe, right? The fact that it was a vice kingdom and didn't quite have a an independent policy doesn't actually make it less uh, of a power or something. In fact, it could be used also in the broader European balance. Um, Venice still remained up to the end of the 17th century a uh, a real superpower, right? And that counting for Italy as much as you know it bled the the Ottoman Empire white with the War of Candia. It, it marked kind of all an age, uh, an aspect. They say also minor powers like Savoy were to, to gain, to gain uh, relevance, as you know, in the international scene. Tuscany remained Tuscany. Um, the, the Papal States remained Papal States, right? The Duchy of Milan was under the Spanish, though, and, and out under the Austrians after the the war of Spanish succession there was some switching with Sardinia as you know uh, Savoy first got Sicily then exchanged it with Sardinia later on uh, but again these were important assets that even though in, in, in a game that was eventually done by, pow the, by powers that were out of Italy in Italy still counted on those resources also because again up to the expoliations of the Napoleonic Wars Italy was a hell of a rich country even though under mo mo not even by the majority in fact again if you count the, the number of lands and inhabitants under somebody else's uh, control at least and this uh, again it makes you reflect on how even modern contemporary events are always closer to the middle ages than than we think in many ways so as I was saying at the beginning of the video, I think we made already three or even four videos about the 
the treaty slash peace of Lodi and not really talk much about Italian signories overall. But again, the, the po so-called uh, equilibrium balance policy is one of the most important and still studied and uh, perhaps underappreciated topics in late medieval Europe. And in fact, we will have to explain that also from the perspective of the foreign countries that were interested in Italy, because here everybody, the Habsburgs, the French, the Spanish, all had a specific, the Swiss too. At some point the Duchy of Milan could have been taken over by the Swiss, and fortunately for Switzerland this didn't happen, because it changed, uh, it would have changed its future for, for the wars, considering how eventually history went, but again at the time it wouldn't know. So sometimes bloodsheds like the ones of Marignano even help, even we don't realize that. In any case, um, that this single perspective is very important because every country had a specific political and strategic plan for its role in the peninsula, right? And that was also rooted in older relations, which is again something that just by talking about the the Treaty of Lodi and the uh, those 40 years we haven't seen not just for the afterwards but especially for the before right very underappreciated for example are the Germanic relations with uh, northern Italy in this and the Ghibelline ideal that was really alive at the time Maximilian of Habsburg fought there etc because again there have been also historiographical perspectives have been uh, discarded or kind of say no it wasn't like that or somebody some historian said it at some point and nobody studied it to verify it let's say uh, and and nobody really cared and so history was written taking another course and you have no idea how often this happens like I, I'm starting to at least in, in my direct experience I've seen that European history I've seen it mostly for, for, for the, the Middle Ages and I can't think how true this is for for modern or contemporary times has been in many ways completely misread uh, in in so many crucial aspects that it makes you wonder even what, what historians have have been doing up to this point not that again the average idiot can come here and say you know, um, you know I know better but let's say when you understand at least the scale of some misassessments and, and you you start thinking that this may not be just an isolated case, also because it does really replicate. You start saying, "Wow, here we have to really be watchful and careful about what we what we write and say." And yeah, telling history, making history is always very difficult, but really difficult in ways that you know can never be fully appreciated until you find yourself in tune. Them and and this is what I personally try to transmit whenever I make a video. Even you would think these topics are a bit too general, like saying, "Yeah, but I want to know what what actually happened." I don't know in this war, in this polity, in this here, like these years. Yeah, we we will hopefully get to that. But again, I think it's important to start from the broader picture because if one even misses that, it just becomes like the fair of, of niche topics that however people can alienate themselves in and not understanding what properly they were because they lack the context right so probably we'll keep making videos about uh, the treaty of Lodi like this but because there are lots of aspects that deserve attention for today stop it here however i hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise do a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.